Thanks a lot, Ilka. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I, I was excited to see all these folks here. It's a nice to see you. It's a, I think this is a big advantage, what we have learned. I think this is one of the things we can keep maybe after Corona times, because I think there is not such an easy opportunity to have such a broad audience. So that's really cool. So now I want to present you part of the work in my lab, which is going on within the research consortium, which is called the Autotrophy Heterotrophy Switch in Cyanobacteria, Coherent Decision-Making at Multiple Regulatory Layers, in short, SKY code. So this is the abbreviation for this research unit, which exists since almost three years. And, and the topic of it is to understand this complex metabolism, which turns out to be the case in cyanobacteria. So the cyanobacterial metabolism is fundamental for the ecosystem Earth and is a promising option for a sustainable bioeconomy. And more and more work has been done now in recent years in cyanobacteria because we can use them as green cell factories. But for that, we need really to have an in-depth understanding of this very very complex metabolism, I think, which was largely and completely underestimated until only a few years ago. In reality, it's not just a simple photoautotrophic organism that usually it is uh, presented as such in the textbook, but in reality, the metabolism evolved to constantly switch between an autotrophic phase where glyconeogenetic reactions occur and heterotrophic phases where under certain conditions then the glycolytic roots are used. This occurs, for example, during this constant day-night switches and during these autotrophic phases in the sunlight when CO2 is fixed, the cells make all the cellular biomass and they also produce some reserves storage with in principle glycogen, but most of the carbon, which is fixed here, goes in all directions, but most of it goes in the direction of the anabolic reactions. For that, I have to shortly explain, when you fix CO2, the first stable fixation product is the glycerate 3-phosphate. And from there, you can, via the so-called lower glycolysis pathways, deviate most of the organic molecules that are used as cellular building blocks like fatty acids, amino acids, pigments, and so on. All this comes from reactions of freshly fixed CO2, which is going here in the lower glycolytic route first. So, whereas then under certain other conditions, the glycogen is then consumed and thereby the cells employ different glycolytic roots. And this is something unique to cyanobacteria is that they have at least three, presumably four different glycogen catabolic pathways, which are operated in parallel. So they have the meyerhoff parnas pathway, the entner dudorov pathway, and the oxidative pentose phosphate pathway also, which is a reversal of the Calvin cycle in a certain extent. So all these reactions are occurring in one single cell, and they are operating partially in parallel or in opposing routes, and this is a very complex task. And it was not really well understood how this complexity is regulated. And this was the challenge of this research unit to find for this coherent decision making in which direction goes the reaction. There must be a coordinated program and there must be central regulators which take care that there is no chaos in the cell, but everything is fine tuned and goes in the right way. So this was the challenge and this is the large aim of this research unit. And these switches occur, for example, whenever cells are switched from light to dark, this can occur, for example, during day when shadow comes or when something unforeseen happens. You have light-dark shifts, you have circadian day-night switches, you have, of course, these constant oscillations. Then you may have responses towards high or low CO2 and also high and low light and also to nitrogen, from nitrogen presence to nitrogen deprivation. So the switches in response to nitrogen are extremely well studied in my lab since the time when I was postdoc because I started with studying the nitrogen regulation. And with this, I entered into the field of this nitrogen starvation response, which was completely unexplored 20 years ago. And this was an observation that I made first time at the Pasteur Institute when I wanted to see how do cells behave in the absence of nitrogen. And I could see the cells are turning yellowish. And at that time, Nicole told me, yeah, it's known that under nitrogen starvation, cell make a chlorosis and then they die, throw the cultures away. But I was curious and I wanted to see what happens if I add nitrogen. And then what I could see is that a few days afterwards, the cells were green again. And at that time, and this was in 1994 or 93, I thought, Whenever I will succeed in my academic career, this would be something nice to study. And so from that time, I had always this system in mind and then slowly developed this into a model system. 
So, and this is what we know today when the cells are starved for nitrogen, they make this nitrogen chlorosis process, but this is not a test, but this is a survival program in reality, as we could find out. There is a strong morphological change. The cells degrade the tyloquid membranes. So this is our old chlorotic cells. You can see the tyloquids are almost gone, but instead now they have these large inclusions, which are PHP granules, but also lots of glycogen. They're completely filled up with glycogen. And in this chlorotic stage, they can survive for a very long time, months, maybe even years. And these cells are viable and can be revived and called this resuscitated in a quite rapid manner. And I will talk about that later on. So what has this to do with this autotrophic heterotrophic switch? So we can say that the nitrogen starvation leads to a very strong reprogramming of autotrophic metabolism. Because in the absence of nitrogen, all these anabolic reactions which need combined nitrogen cannot take place anymore. You can't make amino acids in the absence of nitrogen. So these pathways down to the amino acids, they are somehow blocked. But instead, we could see that the cells are completely filled up with glycogen within only two days. So we have a complete rewiring of metabolism. And this is the first part of the story that I want to show you. It's a first key control point that we only found out very recently. And this key control point occurs exactly at that point where CO2 enters metabolism. We heard that the first stable product of Rubisco is 3-phosphoglycerate. And the 3-phosphoglycerate has two options. It can either go up glycolytic to make glycogen or to enter the Calvin-Benson cycle. Or you can use it to make 2-phosphoglycerate and to enter the lower glycolytic pathways into these anabolic reactions for the production of amino acids. And during vegetative growth, a large part of the available 3-PGA is used by the PGAM enzyme, which means phosphoglycerate mutase. The phosphoglycerate mutase converts 3-PGA to 2-PGA, and from there you can go into the lower glycolysis. And this reaction is in an active state in vegetatively growing cells. But now, when the cells are starved for nitrogen, we identified that the P2 protein, which I don't present in detail today, which binds a small protein, which we have identified as a novel P2 interactor. We called it PRC for P2 interacting regulator of carbon flux. And this PRC protein turns out to be an inhibitor of PGAM. And this occurs when the cells are starved for nitrogen, which is sensed by the P2 protein. So the P2 protein senses the nitrogen starving, releases the PRC protein, and the PRC protein now stops the flux of carbon downstream and redirects it upstream towards glycogen. And now, initially after nitrogen starvation induction, in the first two days, the glycogen storage is completely filled up until the cells are full of glycogen. And then they really slowly start to slow down the entire metabolism. And under prolonged starvation, we have a slow turnover around the glycogen. And then we could show that during this phase, glycolytic reactions through the EMP pathway are responsible for a gradual accumulation of PHP. So the PHP, in fact, is not directly produced from fresh fixed CO2, but it is produced from the glycogen that has first built up and then is afterwards degraded and then ends up as PHB. And this is what happens during this prolonged starvation. And this reaction slow down more and more and more until the cells reach a complete dormant state. And when they resuscitate, we can observe a very fast activation of metabolism, but I will talk on this in a few minutes. I want first to show you what happens in the absence of the PRC protein. In a PRC deficient mutant, we could see that when these cells are starved for nitrogen, then we have first also an initiation of glycogen, but not that much glycogen is produced because PGAM doesn't rewire the metabolism as strongly. And afterwards, during these prolonged phases, much more PHP is produced than in the wild type because now there is no closure at this point. And the PGAM reaction allows now a flux from 3-PGA to 2-PGA and towards acetyl-CoA from where PHB is produced. And this is how these cells look. These PRC deficient strains after two weeks of nitrogen starvation have roughly double amount of PHP than the wild type cells. And then Moritz Koch in my lab worked with the aim to produce a PHP super producing strain. He used this mutant and added, in addition, the FARB genes, which produce the precursors for PHP synthesis. So those were overexpressed. And now he ended up with cells which are almost completely filled with PHP. So this is the largest amount of PHP in cyanobacterial cells detected so far, just by using the knowledge on this control of the PGAM reaction. 
now with this, I come to the next topic. This is the response. What happens now when these chlorotic cells are resuscitated? Then again, we can see a switch of metabolism. There is now the next switch, the switching on of this heterotrophic phase. The glycogen reserves fuel this resuscitation program. We found out, and this was the PhD thesis of Alex Klotz, performed together with Wolfgang Hess, transcriptomic analysis, and we performed detailed morphological studies and so on. So we could see that this resuscitation, we could divide it in principle in two major phases. In the first phase, you don't see anything. The cells remain pale and chlorotic. But in reality, at the molecular level, we can see a lot. Already one or two hours after adding nitrate, these cells, they start to respire, independent whether light is on or off. They really switch their metabolism to a heterotrophic respiratory mode, a light independent. And we can see a rapid increase in ATP synthesis and the translational machinery switched on and so on. I don't go into these details. I want to focus on the glycogen part, just to give you a brief overview. And only after about, yeah, between 16 hours or 18 hours, then we see first traces of chlorophyll being synthesized. Then the cells go through a mixotrophic phase where they start to make some photosynthesis, but still will use their glycogen reserves. And only after about two days or three days, finally, they have resumed their photosynthetic machine and then start making oxygen again and growing in a purely photoautotrophic mode. So this shows you that mutants that are deficient in glycogen degradation, the glycogen phosphorylases, do not recover. Whereas mutants which are unable to produce PHP, they are fine. So PHP is not involved in this recovery program. It's purely dependent on the glycogen as a reserve material and not on PHP. So in this slide shows you, this was done by Sofia Duelio that immediately after adding nitrate, we could see a rapid increase in the ATP levels. So she got interested in this phenomenon, and I will just briefly explain you what came out from this study of this initial ATP increase after adding sodium nitrate to the cells. So that was published beginning of this year in Current Biology. And to make a long story short, I just tell you the highlights of this story. So we can say that as long as the cells are growing in the vegetative mode, the ATP synthesis is carried out in the siloquid membrane mostly, where you have the photosynthetic machines and you have the bulk of the ATPases in the tyloquid membrane. Whereas in the chlorotic state, the tyloquids are degraded, so this machinery doesn't exist anymore. By contrast, there is an alternative respiratory electron transport chain here in the cytoplasmic membrane. So this is what is the status. And now what was peculiar in the studies from Sophia is she could see that this rapid ATP increase was independent of glycogen utilization. And we couldn't make any sense out of it because we were convinced that the glycogen utilization is involved in the synthesis of the elevated levels of ATP through respiration. We could see respiration is going on, ATP increases, but apparently this ATP increase could be independent of this initial respiration. Then she found out that this ATP increase, in fact, consists of two different phenomena. And one of the causative agents of the rapid ATP increase is the sodium molecule itself, because we added for resuscitation sodium nitrate. And when she added instead of sodium nitrate, she just adds sodium chloride. Then she sees also an ATP increase, which is directly proportional to the amount of sodium chloride. So sodium, the addition of more sodium, gives rise to more ATP. So there is a sodium motive force somehow involved in the process. And then she could show that, in fact, this increase in ATP consists of two components. One component, which is this solely sodium-dependent effect when we add for the resuscitation 70 millimolar sodium nitrate. When she adds potassium nitrate, she only sees a gradual and much slower increase in the ATP. So by adding one after the other, she could dissect this into two different parts. And she could inhibit this nitrate-dependent increase of the ATP was sensitive, for example, towards inhibitors of resuscitation, like, for example, towards MSX, which is an inhibitor of glutamate synthetase, or also this mutant which cannot respire, which is unable to degrade glycogen. The GLGP mutants also do not show this purely nitrate-dependent part of the ATP increase. So the ATP increase is partially prone due to a direct increase in the sodium force and, moreover, slower by initiation of respiration. 
And from that, we came to that model that apparently in the chlorotic cells, the cells switch towards an energy generating system, which depends on the cytoplasmic membrane on the ATP synthesis that use this the sodium motive force at the cytoplasmic membrane, which in vegetative cells is also present, but in vegetative cells, the sodium motive force at the cytoplasmic membrane is used for CO2, or better to say for bicarbonate uptake. We have the sodium dependent bicarbonate uptake systems that utilize the sodium motive force but in the chlorotic cells, the cells can make ATP out of this sodium motive force. And therefore, this ATP increase is also completely sensitive to inhibitors of sodium transporters and sodium channels. Okay, so with this, we come now to the next question. We have two components. One is this purely sodium motive force dependent thing that Sophia identified, but she could also see the second component that was dependent on the initiation of metabolism provoked by the assimilation of nitrogen through the gs Gugart pathway, which also requires respiration. That means that the ongoing nitrogen assimilation somehow tunes on now the consumption of glycogen. Glycogen degradation is through triggered by the assimilation of nitrogen in these long-term chlorotic cells. And this goes very rapidly. Even when the cells have been starved for months, they start now respiring within one or two hours. They are already prepared for it. And we could see that the most important enzymes for respiration are already present in the chlorotic cells. That means the chlorotic cells already wait for the nitrogen. They have prepared the entire machinery to degrade the nitrogen and they only need it. And then they can really rapidly switch on metabolism and go to the glycogen catabolic reactions. And now we were interested to understand how is this regulated? And for that, we have to look more carefully again at the glycogen metabolic roots. Glycogen is made from glucose 6-phosphate via the phosphoglucomotase, which converts it in glucose 1-phosphate. From there, you go via the GLGC to ATP glucose. And from there, the glycogen synthase and the branching enzymes, they make the glycogen granules. And these glycogen granules are then degraded by the glycogen phosphorylases and by the debranching enzymes. And this ends up as glucose 1-phosphate, which is then back converted by the same phosphoglucomotases to glucose 6-phosphate. And from there, you can go into different catabolic pathways. And one thing is very interesting that many of these enzymes occur in two versions in the isoenzymes for GLGA1 and A2 phosphorylase P1 and phosphorylase P2, debranching enzyme 1 and 2. And there was also an annotation of phosphoglucomotase 1 and 2. And strikingly, it appeared that always only one of these two enzymes seems to be important for the process, as you can see for the phosphorylase. Only the mutation of the GLGP has a phenotype, whereas the mutation of the GLGP1 isoenzyme has no phenotype, it behaves like the wild type. And the same is true for the glycogen synthesis enzymes. So there seems to be a hidden specificity behind these isoenzymes, which is a challenging question. What turns on now this glycogen utilization when nitrogen can be assimilated again? This is the question. And for that, we look at the transcriptome, also at the proteome. The proteome data were generated by Philip Spät. And what we can see is that all these enzymes are already present at high levels at the beginning. From the start on, they are there at high levels, higher even than in vegetatively growing cells. Chlorotic cells have more of the glycogen catabolic enzymes than vegetative cells, which is surprising, but which must mean that there must be a strict regulation because also the catabolic enzymes are there. They are not used. They are somehow inactive. There is only one exception, and the exception is the phosphoglucomotase. The phosphoglucomotase is in low abundance and the abundance increases. And more interesting even, this phosphoglucomotase was identified by Phil as a phosphoprotein. So it has two phosphocytes which behave in an opposing way. One phosphocyte which increases in phosphorylation during recovery and one phosphocyte which decreases in phosphorylation. And we can also see that the activity of this glucomotase strongly increases during resuscitation. So this seems to be a controlling point of the pathway. So we got more interested in it and looked more carefully what are these two phosphocytes. So we didn't care about phosphoglucomotase about two years ago, I have to say. I always thought these mutases are boring enzymes because they don't do very much. They just turn the glucose from one side to the other. But I think this was an error in reality. Now I am convinced that these mutases are highly interesting and serve as regulatory key points. 
this serial residue, 168, this is the catalytic serin residue. What does the phosphoglucomutase do? The phosphoglucomutase, I think we can see in the next slide, converts glucose 6-phosphate to 1-phosphate or vice versa. If we go with glucose 6-phosphate into the site, then we get phosphorylation of the molecule to make glucose 1,6-bisphosphate as an intermediary compound. Then this compound turns around and gives back the phosphate, but in this time from the 6th position, and we end up with glucose 1-phosphate, which is then released to the medium. And you can also do the same, the other way around, you can enter with glucose 1-phosphate, you can add the phosphate to the 6th position, you turn it around, the 1 position relieves back the phosphate, re-synthesizes the active state and releases glucose 6-phosphate. And this means that the activity of the enzyme is higher when this catalytic serial residue is in a phosphorylated state. So this depicts the activation of the PGM. So what is the second site now doing? So we, we suspected that this second site could be a regulatory site, which keeps the enzyme somehow inactive when it is in a highly more phosphorylated state. And during this activation process, the phosphorylation level at this second site is strongly tuned down. And therefore, Sophia introduced several mutations. At this part, she made a phosphomimetic mutant, which has an aspartate residue, and she made a non-phosphorylated mutant, which is an alanine mutation at this place. And how do they behave? So the alanine mutant has about 50% activity compared to the wild type state, whereas the phosphomimetic mutant is totally inactive. That confirms that a phosphorylation here at this place will make the enzyme inactive. So now this alanine mutant, how does it change the metabolic state in the cell? So she transformed this gene into the wild type. And now the cells have two versions of the PGM. They have this phosphorylated version and they have a constitutive version which cannot be phosphorylated because it has an alanine residue at that part. And now we can see what happens. Initially, they behave absolutely identical. There is not much difference. But the longer they stay in chlorosis, the more this variant with the serial 63 loses viability and finally dies off. And it also degrades its glycogen. So it shows that when this PGM is not closed by phosphorylation, it is not able to completely shut off glycogen consumption more glycogen is used, and this premature glycogen degradation then decreases the viability of the cell. And interestingly, this phosphorylation site is highly conserved. So even in the mammalian and the human PGM, it's also present there, and it has been proposed to be a phosphorylatable site, but it has never really been strictly shown what happens. And so, so she also introduced this aspartate phosphomimetic variant there, and she also could show that the same happens, also completely inactive enzyme. So maybe this is a general mechanism in all organisms that have this type of PGM enzymes, which are a lot of organisms. So now we were looking for enzymes that interact with PGM, for example, a kinase or a phosphatase. We wanted to find out what's going on. And therefore, she made a pulldown of PGM. And in this pulldown, astonishingly, she found the next enzymes downstream of PGM, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and its partner protein, the OPCA. OPCA is that activator of the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, as we have proven here. So I don't go into this detail. In the end, what we could show is that in vitro, we could reconstitute the interaction between PGM and this glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase in OPCA. And what Sophia could show is that PGM interacts with OPCA first, and then the PGM-OPCA complex that has been formed here. This is an analysis performed on the octet machine. And this complex then can then bind and associate the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And the entire process is redox-tuned. So this happens very nicely with oxidized OPCA. But if you reduce OPCA with DTT, then OPCA will not bind to the phosphoglucomutase. This is what you can see here. And the complex does not form. So with this, we come to this model. What goes on in the chlorotic state when we assume the cell is in a reduced state? The OPCA is reduced and does not bind PGM. PGM is phosphorylated and is not active and the glycogen is not consumed. But now when resuscitation starts through the operation of the gs gogart cycle, the cells become oxidized. The OPCA protein binds PGM and activates the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And now we switch on these reactions and very nicely, now through this 
binding of PGM to this enzyme, we hypothesize now that this leads to metabolic channeling, that now the glucose knows where it has to go. It will go to the OPP pathway because it is channeled presumably due to the vicinity of PGM with the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. And now, very briefly, just very novel new discovery made in the lab by Niels Neumann, just to give you a glimpse of what he has done here. He also works on these enzymes. He first focused more on the phosphorylases and found very interesting results. I just show you, he also analyzed some properties of the PGMs. And Niels showed that the PGM is strongly activated by glucose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is from mammalian cells a known activator of the PGM. And he also showed that this enzyme is strongly inhibited by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate inhibits the PGM and glucose 1,6-bisphosphate activates it. And now there is a second PGM, this PGM2, which is cryptic. And it was shown that this PGM2 has very low PGM activity and only contributes to 3% of total PGM activity, but nevertheless is an essential enzyme, which was completely non-understandable. But now to make a longer story short, what Niels finally could show, Niels identified the first bacterial glucose 1,6-bisphosphate synthase. So far, it is completely unknown how in bacteria the activator of the PGM is synthesized. And Niels could show that the PGM2 makes glucose 1,6-bisphosphate out of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and glucose 6-phosphate, takes these molecules and transfers the phosphate from the fructose onto the glucose, and thereby he creates glucose. 1,6-bisphosphate, which then can activate PGM1. And this is a completely novel level of regulation and leads to this hypothesis that the PGM2 could be a major controller of the central metabolism because it connects the levels of all these metabolites to make the activator molecule glucose 1,6-bisphosphate, which then activates PGM. But as known from mammalian cells and from the glycolytic reactions in mammalians, the glucose 1,6-bisphosphate there has also further targets than just the PGM and could activate other enzymes. So that means that through the activity of the PGM2, other enzymes could strongly be activated and that could give rise to an additional layer of control over this heterotrophic, autotrophic switch in the cyanobacterial metabolism. Yes, and with this... I want to stop at that place and I want to acknowledge the people that have done the work, mostly Niels and Sophia, which are the two crew workers in the SkyCode program. Also Moritz Koch, which did the work on PHP mostly, and Jörg Scholl, who discovered the PRC protein, and Markus Burkhardt, who also worked on the sodium story. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I hope I was not too long. <laughs>